Welcome to the fifth lecture on bug advocacy. Today's lecture looks at the bug workflow from a different perspective, the perspective of the psychology of decision making. Imagine that Joe reports a bug. The project manager rejects it or defers it immediately. But a week later, Jane reports the same bug and it gets fixed. What's the difference? In my experience, a tester's personal credibility significantly affects how people handle their bug reports. For example, suppose Joe reports every problem he sees, no matter how minor, but Jane reports only serious bugs. If you got an email pointer to a new bug report, wouldn't you immediately expect it to be serious if Jane wrote it and less serious if Joe wrote it? If you were the project manager, how would that affect how quickly you went to the report and how carefully you read it? Bug handling involves a series of decisions. I'm going to start with the decisions that are made by testers. Should you report a bug? How much time should you spend troubleshooting it, writing it up? After you report a bug, the programmer and the project manager have to decide whether to fix it or to defer it or do something else with it. Suppose they defer the bug. Should you appeal it? Should you try to convince the triage team to make them fix it? If you're going to argue against a project manager's decision to defer or reject the bug, you will probably lose unless you can provide better information than you wrote in the original report. It takes time to prepare an appeal that deserves to win. Too many testers feel they have to appeal every bug deferral. This is a critical mistake. Every time you appeal a deferral and lose, you lose credibility. Every time you appeal, your basis should be so clear, so well-reasoned and researched that the people who come to the appeal meeting should agree that you raised a serious issue and it was well worth their time to hear you out. The test manager or test lead have decisions to make too. When a bug gets deferred, they have to decide whether to encourage or discourage a tester from appealing the deferral. If the tester has a lot of research to do to make her case, the supervisor has to give her time to do it, or not. If the project manager has been treating testers with insufficient respect, or if this is a shy and still inexperienced tester, the test lead might decide to come to the triage meeting just to provide personal support for this appeal. Every stakeholder who has input to the triage team gets to evaluate bug deferrals, to think about the implication of that deferral to them. Every one of them builds credibility or loses it with each intervention. Imagine two tech support managers. I'm going to call one the whiner, the other one the accountant. They're both at the same company. At triage meetings, the whiner expressed his personal disappointment with us for deferring bugs. He made personal appeals to our high standards. He also appealed to our guilt. The accountant didn't bother. Instead, he talked about money and consequences. This bug was similar to that one. That one cost us this much in support. And in refunds, this other bug was similar to a competitor's. They got bad press. If he didn't have data, he said so, but then he described the types of complaints that he expected. In terms of their effect on bug deferrals, we learned to ignore the whiner. On the other hand, we came to treat the accountant as an expert. Even executives have limited control. A vice president can tell me to fix something, but he doesn't know how long it's going to take. Neither do I, so I can use some heuristics to make my estimate. For this vice president, a week is my estimate. There are only so many weeks. How badly does he want this? Every one of these people is making decisions. All of these decisions are made under uncertainty. People are making their best guesses about what the right thing is to do. Now, decision making under uncertainty has been intensely studied. It is subject to many significant biases and heuristics. I'm not going to distinguish between a bias and a heuristic here. Think of either of them as creating a predisposition toward making one decision over another. The main biasing variable that's been talked about in books about software testing has been motivation, preferred result. Glenn Myers wrote about this back in 1979. He emphasized that we should think about testing as executing the program with the intent of finding errors, because people who intend to find errors are more likely to find them than people who want to confirm that the program works. Now, every few years it gets fashionable for programmers to whine about testers who say they want the programs to fail. The programmers claim that attitude has nothing to do with what bugs the testers will find, and therefore these negative personalities, these cheerleaders of failure, should be kept off of software development projects so they don't pollute the good vibes that real developers need. The problem is that the world doesn't work that way. Do a search sometime on the phrase experimenter effects. One of the big challenges in all areas of empirical research is that experimenters who want an experiment to come out one way instead of another are more likely to get that result. 
They bias how they design their experiments, how they run their experiments, how they deal with mistakes that they make during the experiments, how they analyze data, how they read the graphs, how carefully they look at what they're getting. I'm not talking about dishonest researchers here. This is an unconscious biasing problem that affects every science. This is why so many scientists insist on the importance of independent replication of experimental results, which is standard for almost every science. It's not because everybody commits fraud, so you have to redo their work. It's because honest people are subject to experimenter effects. If you want to find bugs, you are more likely to find bugs. If you expect to find bugs, you are more likely to find bugs. If you get rewarded for finding bugs, you are more likely to find bugs. And on the other hand, if you adopt a nicey-nicey attitude and just want to help the programmers demonstrate that their program works, you're going to miss a lot of bugs. It's not just that you won't report them. You just won't see them. Two other powerful biasing variables are perceived probability and expected consequence. Let me illustrate these in terms of a very simple experiment. Psychologists have been doing variations on this experiment for over 150 years. I did my first doctorate in psychophysics, the field that studies the measurement of perceptual experience. And so I know this type of experiment really well. Here are two sounds, beep and beep. For the video, I tried to make the second one really obviously louder than the first. Suppose I play a sound to you and ask which one it was, the quiet one or the loud one. It should be pretty easy to tell them apart. But in the lab, we can use sounds that are similar enough that sometimes people will make a mistake. They can actually be pretty dissimilar and you still get some mistakes. It's kind of surprising. So in our experiment, I play a sound and I say, was this the loud one or was this the soft one? And you tell me, and then I tell you whether you were right. And then I play another sound and you tell me again, and I tell you whether you were right. And we do this a few hundred times a day for several days until you are a very experienced judge. Then I can study your long-term performance. Of course, to control for experimenter effects, we use a computer to present the sounds and give you the feedback, because the computer doesn't care about the results. Now, I can set this experiment up so that 90% of the time, I play the softer sound. And if I do that, then even when I play the loud sound, you'd be pretty likely to hear the soft one. I don't just mean you'd be more likely to say the sound was soft. I mean that your subjective experience would be soft. You would hear it as the quieter beep. You would insist if I asked you about it. No, that was the quiet beep. Not always, but sometimes, and way more often than if 90% of the time what I gave you was the loud beep. The bias is that if you believe something is likely to be a certain way, your perceptions will tend to conform to your expectation. People see and hear what they expect. Now, this has been common knowledge. People see what they expect to see. It's been common knowledge for a long time, like maybe a few thousand years. What was more surprising over the last 150 years of research is that trained observers are still subject to this bias and that we don't know how to train people out of it except by training them into some other bias. So another biasing variable that's been well studied is expected consequence. If I can convince you that it's very important to catch every loud beep, if I pay you extra for catching loud beeps compared to soft beeps, you'll catch more loud beeps. Again, this isn't just because you're a good guesser who maximizes income by guessing loud all the time. It changes what you hear. I've done this kind of research. I've talked to my experimental subjects. I've been a subject in these kinds of experiments. It doesn't feel as though the guessing strategy influences my perceptions. You hear what you hear, you report what you hear. Even if you adopt a guessing strategy when you're not sure, it's remarkable how your expectations and your sense of consequence can influence what you subjectively hear and report. Let's put this on a diagram. Diagrams like this are pretty popular. They show up in most introductory psychology textbooks. Instead of deciding whether a tone is loud or soft, let's decide whether a program's behavior is a bug or a feature. Reading the diagram where it says hit, that means that the actual event, what's true about the world, is that the program actually had a bug. And what you said, your response, was correct. The program had a bug. So you score a hit. If the program has a bug, but you don't report it, that's a miss. If you report a non-bug, that's a false alarm. And if the program is working fine and you don't report a bug, that's a correct rejection. Now, correct rejection isn't very descriptive for bug reporting, but that's the traditional term. In the vocabulary of this chart, there are two possible biases. You might be more likely to say bug or more likely to say feature. If you have a bias towards saying bug, you'll have more hits, but more false alarms, fewer misses. 
If you have a bias away from saying bug, you'll have more correct rejections, fewer false alarms, more misses. We know that we can train people to be better observers. In terms of this chart, a better trained person would have more hits and more correct rejections, fewer false alarms and fewer misses. But there's a limit. To the degree that decisions are subject to uncertainty, they are subject to bias. This was the important finding of signal detection theory. With experienced, well-motivated observers, changing their behavior meant changing their bias. You could get more hits from them, but only if you were willing to accept more false alarms. This basic finding has been replicated and extended in thousands of experiments. It's also been well extended into other more complex human decision making. If you have experienced testers who know the program reasonably well and you want to reduce the number of bugs they miss, the price for that is more false alarms. All decision making under uncertainty is biased. We can influence the bias. Manipulating bias in a system has system-wide effects. So let's consider some potential system-wide objectives. Suppose you want to improve the quality of the bug reports. Understand that better bug reports take more time to research and write. What you're affecting here is partially the tester's bias about how much work is enough for a bug report to be well enough written. Feedback is also important. In the bug reporting assignment for this class, I have you evaluate some bug reports in terms of the quality of the bug reporter's research and their communication of that research. The assignment includes a long list of ideas of things to look for or consider in this report. If you became a test manager or a test lead, I strongly suggest that if you want better reports from your staff, you should read a few of their reports every month, more for your junior testers, and provide detailed evaluations. In addition, take advantage of opportunities to point out costs in your project of bad reporting, such as exaggeration, blaming, angry wording, or wasted time caused by unnecessary reports. People will pay attention. It motivates them to improve their reports. But once they're pretty good at reporting, we're back to bias. So let's consider bias focusing first on the bug reporter. If you want more hits, if you want to be able to say that no bugs were missed, if you want your staff to write up every behavior they think might be a problem, you influence their motivation and their expectations about consequences through praise and recognition, through treating reports with respect, through making sure that bugs aren't rejected arbitrarily. You influence perceived probability to some degree with statistics that suggest there are lots of bugs left, if there are. But even if there aren't lots of bugs left, you can make things feel more likely with powerful examples. Late in the project, when simple bugs are hard to find, it's time for good storytelling about ways people found serious bugs that required more complex tests. So these are ideas for increasing our number of hits and tolerating more false alarms. Now, a project's end game involves special challenges because you don't want to miss problems, but your project can't afford to deal with minor bugs that'll be rejected. For this project at this point, these are false alarms. If you choose not to report minor licking bugs, some things are going to look minor to black box testers that are really pretty serious. The testers don't look at the code. They don't understand what the implications of some of the minor looking failures really are. So not reporting them is an option. But if you want to bias your staff to report them, you can change the reporting method to reduce the system-wide costs. For example, by mentioning them in passing or by reporting them into the database for the next release, especially if the project manager and programmers will skim that database every now and again, looking for potentially more serious problems. Now let's put your evil project manager hat on. You're tired of false alarms. The vice president of bad measurement is running around giving people bonuses for the fewest number of bugs on their projects. So you want to reduce the number of bug reports on your project. There are a lot of ways to do that. Get the tester to think the program probably works. Get him to think his task is to confirm it. Punish people for false alarms. Post their duplicate minor bugs on a scoreboard. Tell everybody the program is late because these testers keep finding bugs, especially bugs they should have found long ago. Tell stories about the urgent need of the program in the field. You can also play some interesting indirect games. For example, some companies assign every tester their own pet programmer. You wouldn't want your favorite programmer to be unhappy or look bad. So in these circumstances, the tester often won't report a bug until the programmer is ready to fix it. And when the programmer finds a bug he's ready to fix, 
he'll give it to the tester to put into the bug tracking system. The numbers look great. The tester has plenty of bugs, and the programmer looks responsive if we measure it by the average number of days between the bug report and the fix. Of course, some bugs magically vanish, the ones that the programmer can't or won't deal with. Paired teams, tester plus programmer, don't necessarily lead to this kind of data manipulation. They can be very effective, but pairing creates this risk. And I've seen one too many presentations on how to manage your programmer to think this risk is unrealistic. It seems, though, that a common thread in the troubling presentations is the presence of bug statistics that everybody's trying to make look better. Bug statistics create a lot of bias in bug reporting, and not always the bias that you might intend. For example, if you measure tester productivity by the number of bugs they report, they might report a lot of bugs. But how does that ripple through the system? How many of those bugs will be dismissed by programmers as unimportant? Because the programmers think the testers are tossing minor bugs into the database to keep their numbers up. This affects morale, it affects bug reporting bias, and it also affects what gets fixed. It biases every decision maker involved in bug deferrals. That has an even further impact on morale and on bug fixing bias. Another way to discourage and demoralize bug reporters to reduce the number of bugs they file is to treat their reports with disrespect. Suppose you have salespeople who are inclined to report problems that they see in the field. If you don't want those bugs, you can achieve them by never giving anybody any feedback about what happened with the report, and generally by making the salesperson feel as though nobody's going to listen to them anyway. And so sending these reports in is a waste of their time. I'm using salespeople as an example intentionally because I've seen test groups treat salespeople this way and then complain that they don't get enough information from the field. Well, just because you don't intend to discourage bug reporting by someone doesn't mean that mistreating them won't achieve it. It's easy to create bias unintentionally. Personal attacks create bias. If you're the test manager, pay careful attention to attacks on your staff. A tester who feels like a target will probably exercise weaker judgment all around, generally to less effect. Sometimes those attacks are self-inflicted. That is, some testers earn their bad reputations. Those are much harder problems to deal with than generalized attacks from frustrated project managers. We've been looking at decisions whether to report bugs or not. Now it's time to look at the decision making involved in whether to fix the bug or not. You can reduce the probability that your bugs will be taken seriously with disorganized reports, reports that drown the reader with irrelevant information. These make programmers grumpy. Reports that express anger or contempt for programmers make the programmers and the project managers even grumpier. Grumpy programmers reject bugs. Triage teams that sympathize with the poor beaten up programmer will approve almost all of that programmer's bug deferrals. You want to be effective? Be nice. Management feedback also creates biases. If managers encourage programmers to fix only the most obvious, most serious bugs, the programmer is going to read bug reports differently and will be more likely to miss valid reports of serious problems. On the other hand, we can increase the probability the bug will be fixed. If the perceived consequences of not fixing it are serious, if the perceived likelihood that this is a worthy problem is high, if the credibility of the people arguing to defer it is low. Some companies have big tester credibility problems because the testers aren't well managed. Suppose that Joe reports every suspected failure, no matter how minor, but Jane reports only obviously serious problems. Now, either of these criteria might be appropriate, but having them both on the same project creates a challenging contrast. Joe's going to get a reputation as somebody who has no judgment. His reports, including his serious ones, are likely to be ignored. Jane, on the other hand, is going to get a reputation for expertise. Her bugs are probably going to get fixed, even the occasional minor bug that she slips in. But she'll miss reporting a lot of genuine, less critical bugs in the process. Test managers can set an expectation with the testers and with the rest of the project team so that all of the testers know whether they should be biased toward reporting everything or toward being very selective and less complete. By making that expectation clear beyond the test group, test managers can influence the perception of their staff 
And if they apply different perceptions to different staff, they have a different standard of expectation for Joe than for Jane, then by clarifying that externally to everyone else on the project team, they can reduce unwarranted impacts on their staff's reputation. So let me sum up the day's work. If you write reports that people won't want to read, they will perceive them as reporting less important bugs. This is how companies end up with huge recall-inducing bugs that somehow make it to the customer. It's not that the bug was never found. It's that the expectation of the people who read the report was that the bug was probably pretty minor. We can ignore it. This illustrates the broad problem that almost all bug-related decisions are made under uncertainty and therefore subject to an array of serious biases. Ignore those biasing variables at your peril.